Hello, I'm Elite Panafieu, and I'm going to present you a joint work with Quentin Lutz from Nokia Bell Labs, Alex Scott from the University of Oxford, and Maya Stein from the University of Chile. Um, we met through the project RonNet, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about active clustering. So, uh, let's start with a very classic problem, the sorting problem. Uh, the goal is to recover uh, a permutation uh, using pairwise queries. Uh, by that I mean we uh, ask if uh, two elements are in uh, the correct order or in decreasing order. Um, we are going to consider a very similar problem. Uh, but instead of recovering a permutation, we are recovering a set partition. Uh, so set partition is just a set of non-empty sets of distinct elements. Uh, and again we use pairwise queries, but this time we ask whether two elements belong to the same block or not. For example here, uh, if the query is 2, 4, then the answer is no, they don't belong to the same block. Uh, in both cases, the complexity is defined as the number of queries used, and the goal is to, of course, design algorithms that minimize the average complexity. Uh, we have not found this very natural setting in the literature so far, so any suggestion would be greatly appreci appreciated. Uh, so here is an example. Uh, let's start with three items, one, three elements, one, two, and three. Uh, first, we ask a query uh, between one and three. If we obtain a positive answer, well, that means 1 and 3 belongs to the same block. And therefore, any query we ask with 1 uh, will get the same answer as this query with 3. Um, so, this is because of transitivity of the similarity relation, right, belonging to the same block. Therefore, if we have a positive answer, we can simply merge one, the elements 1 and 3 into the same vertex, because any query to this vertex will get the same answer uh, for any element we use. So then we ask, for example, the query 2, 1, or 2, 3, same answer, of course. Uh, if the answer is positive, we obtain only one vertex this time with three elements on it. And this corresponds, so we have finished, and at this point, and this corresponds to the set partition with only one block that contains every one. If we had obtained a negative answer at this step, then we would have added uh, an age, so ages in this representation represent uh, negative answers. And here again we are done. Uh, what we see is that we uh, have obtained the set partition with one block containing one three and the other containing only two. We could also at the beginning had obtained a negative answer, in which case we had an age here. Uh, we have two possible queries, we choose one two here, and so on so forth. And what we see is that we, uh, the algorithm is finished when it reaches a complete graph, right? If the graph is not complete, then there are two vertices that are not linked, and those two vertices correspond to two sets of elements which we don't know if they belong to the same block or to distinct blocks. So we need a complete graph to, uh, to finish. Um, so this graph representation uh, I just showed you here, uh, is what we call an aggregated graph. So the vertices, as I said, uh, correspond to set of elements that we know are similar, and the edges correspond to uh, negative answers, to groups of uh, elements we know are dissimilar. Um, and when we have a positive answer to a query, we merge the corresponding two vertices. When we have a negative answer, we add an edge. So I hope this is clear, uh, because all the rest is going to uh, rely on that. Um, so we have three theorems to present. Uh, the first one is going to characterize the uh, active clustering algorithms that reach the minimal average complexity, assuming uniform distribution on the set partitions of size n. The second theorem is going to show that all those algorithms actually have the same complexity distribution. Not just the mean is the same, but the complete distribution on the number of queries are the same, meaning that there is the same probability to ask 
uh, key queries uh, for any of these algorithms. Uh, and the third theorem is going to uh, precisely characterize this distribution and prove a Gaussian limit law. Uh, the motivation for this work came from uh, Maria Laura Mag, uh, engineer at Nokia, and uh, it was to improve the classification of training data by human experts to feed a supervised learning software. Uh, so they were doing classification uh, item by item, looking at an item and deciding which of the 70 classes they had it belongs to. But they didn't like this uh, process and they preferred to uh, input two items and decide whether they belong to the same class or not. It was more efficient for them to work that way. And so we wanted to analyze this setting and see how many queries they were going to, to be asked. Uh, so first, I want to show you that this problem is not as trivial as it might first seem. Uh, a first conjecture was that if you avoid trivial queries, uh, then any queries will do, and the complexity, the average uh, complexity, uh, is going to be the same. So what do I mean by trivial queries? But well, if you know that uh, A and B are in the same block. Uh, and B and C are in the same block, then you already know A, that A and C belong to the same block. That's uh, transitivity. So you don't need to ask uh, the query AC. Uh, I call this query a trivial query. Uh, all the same, if, we o if you already know that uh, A and B are, that if you know that two blocks are, are distinct, you have uh, a negative query between them, you don't need to add um, more negative queries. Um, so I thought all other kind of queries were just fine, but I found uh, quickly this counter example. Uh, so let's say we reached a point where we know that 1 and 2 are in distinct uh, blocks, 2 and 3 are in distinct blocks, 3 and 4 are in distinct blocks, but that's all we know at this point. And let's see what happens if we start with the query 1, 4 and compare it to what happens with, if we start with the query 1, 3. So if we start with 1, 4 and we obtain a positive answer, then it means 1 and 4 belongs to the same block and we can merge them. We have here a complete graph, we are done, we know the set partition that corresponds to this aggregated graph, right? Uh, if we have a negative answer, then we obtain a square. And now it doesn't matter, it's symmetrical which query we ask, so let's say it's 1, 3. Uh, positive answer, we obtain uh, this graph. Uh, this L-shaped graph and we ask the query 2, 4, we obtain those guys. Uh, if we have a negative answer, then we have only one query left possible uh, and we either merge 2, 4 or add this age. And we can read on this tree, which we call the query tree, we can read the average complexity. So how many partitions uh, can we reach from this initial setting? Well, uh, each partition corresponds to, exact, to a leaf, right? And there are one, two, three, four, five leaves. So, okay, there are five possible leaves because we assume uniform distribution on the set partitions. Um, each of them has probability one-fifth of occurring. So the number of queries is the depth or the height of the, the leaf. So we sum the depth of the leaf and divide by the number of leaf, which is 5. So here the sum of the height is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it's 13 over 5. And if we do the same with this first query, I spare you the detail and let you compute it on your own, it's 12 over 5, so it's better here. So obviously, some queries are better than others, and we want to find which ones. Uh, that came as a surprise. Uh, the answer we obtained was also uh, surprising to us. So we p that's a theorem one. Uh, an active clustering algorithm has minimal average complexity if and only if all aggregated graphs are codal. So all the graphs it can go through are all chordal graphs. So what are chordal graphs? Um, chordal graphs are a famous family of uh, perfect graphs. Um, to, 
define them, <coughs> I need to introduce uh, another uh, graph theoretical uh, definition, that of induced graph, subgraph. So this graph here, the square, for example, is induced is a, an induced subgraph of this graph here because uh, it is a subgraph and uh, there are no edge here between vertices <coughs> of this subgraph. Uh, the square graph is not an induced subgraph in this graph here because there is here this edge between two vertices of this subgraph. So a graph is caudal uh, if and only if all induced cycles are triangles. That means you cannot find uh, a square like that in a caudal graph. You, if, whenever you find a cycle, there is a chord in this cycle, something cutting it and making it smaller. Uh, for example, this is a caudal graph, but this is not. Here we have this induced four cycles. Um, so, from a caudal graph, some queries are going to keep uh, whatever answer they get, the graph caudal, and some are not. And it turns out that the queries that are going to keep the graph caudal, and we call them uh, caudal queries, are exactly those uh, such that the intersection of the neighborhoods of the two vertices separates them. So here, for example, uh, look at this initial state. What is the intersection of the neighborhoods of 1 and 3? Well, it's just the vertex 2, right? And if I remove 2 from this graph, then 1 and 3 are not anymore connected. So the intersection of the neighborhoods of 1 and 3 separates them, and indeed, if I add the edge 1, 3, or if I merge the vertices 1 and 3, the graph remains caudal. On the other hand, look at 1 and 4. The intersection of the neighborhoods is empty. And if I remove, well, nothing, uh, then 1 and 4 are still connected. So removing the intersection of the neighborhoods does not uh, separate them. And 1, 4 is indeed a non-caudal query. If I obtain a negative answer, I obtain a square, which is a non-caudal graph. So this theorem 1 characterizes the algorithms that reach the uh, minimal average complexity. Uh, by saying those are exactly those where each query is going to be uh, a caudal query. How do we prove that? I'll give you an intuition here. Uh, you'll read uh, soon an article uh, for the complete proof. Um, so, if the partition contains n elements and k blocks, uh, b1, bk, then we know how many positive answers we are going to get, right? Um, because the positive answers are going to be a forest of k trees, one for each block. And so the number of edges in this forest is going to be n minus k. On the other hand, the number of negative answers uh, is, can vary a lot. Uh, it is the sum of the number of negative answers between any two uh, blocks. And so, we focused on the number of negative answers in the setting where we have only two blocks. And in this setting, uh, some queries are useful, but some are not. And the queries that are not uh, useful, we, we call them wasteful, uh, there are those that connect two vertices that are at the ends of a node-induced path. So here, for example, we have a path of length uh, 3, that's odd. And so because we have only two blocks, we know this guy and this guy are in different blocks. This guy and this guy are in different blocks, so the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Those two guys belong to the same block. But so this guy is in a different block of this one. And if we know there are only two blocks, then asking this query is going to get an negative answer that we could have avoided. This query is called wasteful. Uh, an algorithm has minimal average complexity on two blocks, if and only if it avoids the wasteful queries. Um, 
But of course, in reality, in the general setting, we don't know how many blocks we have. However, it turns out that the codal algorithms are exactly those that avoid the wasteful queries uh, for any subset that has the potential to be the union of two blocks exactly. So why is that? Well, if a set can be the union of exactly two blocks, it means that the graph, uh, the aggregated graph on it, is a bipartite graph, right? It can be colored with two colors. But the bipartite induced graph subgraphs of codal graphs are forests. And in forests, you never have cycles, so you never have a wasteful, you can never have a wasteful query there. On the other hand, um, non codal algorithm contain at least one wasteful query, and therefore they cannot be optimal. Um, to see that, let's see the first time um, the graph becomes non codal because of a query and the negative answer to this query. Uh, well, at this time we have a cycle of length at least four, right? If this cycle has even length, that means the query was linking an induced path of odd length, and therefore it was a wasteful query. Otherwise, so that's the first case here. Otherwise, C is uh, as an odd length. But that means if we wait uh, and look at only negative answers uh, from now on, what happens is that the graph around it is going to, to, to have more and more edges. Uh, and at some point, because we have to get to the complete graph, we will have to ask a query between two vertices of the cycle. Uh, and this, this query is going to be wasteful uh, automatically. Um, and so that's the, the spirit of the proof of uh, why uh, codal graphs are exactly those that minimize the average uh, complexity. Now, let's go for theorem 2. Um, theorem 2 tells us that all codal algorithms have the same complexity distribution, so not only the same average number of query, but the same probability to ask exactly k queries for any integer k. Uh, the proof is by induction of the number of missing edges of the aggregated graph. Um, the initialization is very easy. Uh, it's when there are no missing edges, so the graph G is complete graph. Then there are no more queries to ask, and indeed uh, any codal choices of query is going to be equivalent at this point. So let's look at the induction. Uh, to talk about it, I need a notation. Uh, I'm going to write G with U comma V when I add the edge U V to G, and G with U divided by V. Uh, when I merge the vertices u and v in g. So the first one would correspond to a negative answer to the query uv and the second one to a positive answer. Um, it turns out that if g and uh, g with the additional edge uv are codal, assuming u and v are not connected in, in g, are not an edge in g, uh, then merging u and v also keeps the graph codal. Um, observe that uh, the complexity distribution is equal to the high distribution of the leaves of the query tree, as I explained before. So now we can deal with the induction. Uh, consider two codal queries uv and wx in the graph g. So g is codal, g with the additional edge uv is codal, and G with the additional edge WX is also codal. Uh, if we can add those two edges at the same time and keep the graph also codal, then we can very simply switch the queries. We can start with the query UV and then do the query uh, WX or the other way around. And all of the graphs are going to be codal. And now we can see that um, so, that starting with the query uv 
gives the same distribution as starting with the query wx. If we start with uv, then we know that we can, by induction, use any order, any um, codal query will give the same distribution from now on, so we choose to do the query wx. Uh, and the other way around here. So we obtain two possible query trees that uh, go on and forth after here. But they have the same uh, nodes at height 2, um, just in a different order. But so the distribution of the height of the leaves is going to be the same. Now, there is another case. It's when uh, G G with the additional H, UV or WX are caudal, all of them. But if we add the two edges together, then the graph is not caudal anymore. And this puts a lot of constraints on the structure of G. Actually, it, the only possibility is that um, there are two... Uh, G can be divided into uh, two parts, A and B which intersection is a, a complete graph K. And K is the intersection of the neighborhoods of U and V and of W and X. And so um, we cannot ask those two queries one after the other, but what we can do is a bit like previously, we can ask first UV and then ask a lot of queries into A until it's a complete graph, and a lot of query into B until it's a complete graph. If we had done the other way around, if we had started with the query WX, and then a lot of query on A, a lot of query on B, we would end up in a completely symmetric situation. So the distribution on the number of queries is going to be the same again for those two trees. Um, and so the con this concludes the proof of theorem 2. And finally, we have a theorem. I'm very sorry, it's a bit ugly. I should go back. No, okay, we have to face it. Um, the slide is a bit ugly, but I wanted the definitions to fit into the same slide as uh, the theorem. So here are a bunch of definitions that we will need. Uh, the Bell number Bn is just the number of set partitions of size n. Very simple. The Lambert function is the solution for x positive of this uh, implicit function. It's linked to the Cayley function, tree Cayley function. Um, and then we have Q analogs. So uh, Q analogs have been introduced uh, to um, generalize uh, integer identities. Um, the, the Q analog of the integer n is just 1 plus Q plus Q to the n minus 1, the sum of n first powers of Q. Then we have the Q factorial, which is, as expected, defined as the product of the Q analogs of the integrals from 1 to n. Then we have the Q exponential. Uh, we replace the factorial with the Q factorial. Uh, and then we have the Q per hammer symbol, uh, which is, well, defined like that. And um, theorem 3 is going to tell us everything we could ever wish to know about um, the distribution of the number of queries used by codal algorithms. Let xn denote the corresponding random variable. Uh, then the probability generating function of xn, uh, we give for it two different expressions. Uh, the first one here, uh, so it's a polynomial in Q, although it's not completely obvious because of this uh, division here. Uh, and this one is very convenient when you want to use a computer algebra system. Uh, I used Sage to check my computations, um, to compute actually uh, in an exact way uh, this probability generating function. But it's not very convenient when you want to do uh, asymptotic analysis uh, because of this uh, alternating sign and magical constellations that appear in there. That's why we derived a second expression and this expression is very beautiful. I will talk about it in the next slide here. Um, so there are a lot of Q analogs here in this expression. So those two are exact um, result for the probability generating function, but we also have 
an asymptotic result, uh, which is that a, if you will normalize the variable xn, subtract its mean and divide by its standard deviation, then uh, the limit is uh, in distribution uh, converged to a standard Gaussian law. And we have, of course, expressions for this, uh, for the asymptotic mean and standard deviations. Uh, and those are expressed using the Lambert function uh, that I said is the solution of this implicit function. Okay. So, in particular, I should mention that uh, the asymptotics of the mean is um, n choose 2 divided by log n. So, we ask almost all the queries uh, possible divided by log n, which is a bit a lot. Uh, so now we want to... Oh, okay, no, we don't prove it immediately. Uh, first, yes, uh, something uh, beautiful and unexpected. Uh, let's P of C denote the generating function of set partitions. So, because a set partition is a set of non-empty sets, labeled, uh, we have, using the symbolic method, see the book of flagellet Sedwick, for example, uh, for an introduction, um, we have P of Z that is the exponential of exponential Z minus 1. Very classic uh, formula. And so it follows that the nth Bell number is the nth uh, Taylor coefficient of the generating function. Uh, and if we, uh, this e to the minus 1, we put it uh, on top, and then we develop this exponential of exponential Z as a series, and we extract the coefficients, then we obtain this classic expression here, 1 over e of the sum of m to the n divided by m factorial. If m and n here were switched, we would have exponential n, but this is not the case. It is a very surprising expression because it doesn't look like an integer, but yeah, it is. Um, and the second formula we obtain, I recall it here, well, it is a Q-analog of this formula. Uh, by that I mean that if we set here q equal to 1, we obtain for the exponential is just uh, the q exponential becomes the exponential, 1 over q becomes 1, uh, this is m to the n, this is m factorial, and this is 1. So we obtain the same uh, formula in a way that uh, is very uh, visible. Uh, and so I found that beautiful. <laughs> Um, okay, so we want to prove this theorem, uh, but first, so how are we going to do it? Uh, theorem 1 told us that caudal algorithms uh, are the ones that reach the minimal average complexity. Theorem 2 told us that they all have the same uh, complexity distribution. Uh, so we can choose which caudal algorithm we are going to actually analyze. Uh, because the result is going to be the same for all caudal algorithms. The one we are focusing on is called, a, we call it the Universal Active Clustering, UAC algorithm. Um, this algorithm works as follows. You take, you start with S, uh, the set S of elements you want to partition, to, to cluster. If it is empty, then uh, the output is the empty partition, of course. Otherwise, we take an element from it, typically the largest element, uh, the one of largest label, and then we query it with all other elements from S. And that way we find the block that contains this element, right? So this block we denote it by B, and then we apply uh, recursively the algorithm to uh, S without the vertice from the items from B, uh, which give us a new partition Q. And we simply, at the end, uh, output this partition queue with an additional block that is B. So let me give you an example here. Uh, we start with five items and we ask, we compare five, the largest uh, item, to all others. And here we only obtain one positive answer too. So now we know that uh, the block containing five is two five only. And we remove them. So we are left with 1, 3, 4, and we apply again the algorithm here. Again, we have only one positive answer, so we know that the block containing 4 is 1, 4. And at the end, we have only one element, so it's a block on its own, and this is the partition that we output. 
So this is the universal uh, active clustering algorithm. We call it universal because uh, in graph theory, uh, a vertex that is linked to every other vertex is called universal. So now we want to obtain the generating function uh, for the complexity of this algorithm. So let us start with just a bijection on a set partitions. Um, let P of Z denote the generating the exponential generating function of set partitions. Um, we have a very simple bijection on set partitions uh, if we don't count the largest label. Uh, look here, the largest label is 6 and there is this block 2, 5, 6. So if we don't count the 6, uh, we have a bijection with, we can set this block apart and remove the 6. And here we have a pair with uh, a partition and a set. To go back, simply uh, look at the largest element here, it's 5, it could be on the left as well. So that means that the largest label on the left was uh, the largest on the right plus 1, 6, and it's, the rest of this block is given as the set, and we just reintroduce it here. So the symbolic method uh, translates this bijection into a relation on the generating function of uh, partitions, uh, namely that the derivative of this derivative generating function is the generating function of partition multiplied by exponential z. It's a partition and a set of elements. This is not surprising. We, we have, we already know, we don't need a differential equation on p, we already know a direct expression for p. Where it is interesting is that it's now easy to add, to introduce an additional variable q to mark the queries used by the universal active clustering algorithm. Um, because to cluster this uh, set partition, what is the algorithm going to do? It's going to take six, the largest label, and compare it to all other elements. So all the elements uh, of this set are going to be compared. So Z here comes with a Q. And all the elements of this partition are going to be compared to the six. So this Z comes with a Q. And after that, we are going to apply again the algorithm on this, uh, on the, the remaining elements. So this Q represents those queries, those additional queries. And we obtain this differential equation, very similar to the previous one, except that now we have an additional viable Q. Um, and so this characterizes uh, the generating function of uh, the complexity for the universal active clustering algorithm with the initial condition, of course, that if z is equal to 0, uh, then p of 0, q is equal to 1. Uh, there are no queries to ask when the partition is empty. How to solve this differential equation? It's not classic differential equation, because you see the second variable comes uh, messing around with the first one here. So we observed that this function, exponential of q over 1 minus q times z, satisfies a somehow similar differential equation. Uh, there is just this term here, this additional term. So we thought, okay, it's similar enough, we are going to look for uh, solutions of this form uh, for p, so introducing a new variable a. And when we do that, the differential equation on p becomes a differential equation on a, which becomes a recurrence on the Taylor coefficients uh, of a with respect to z, and we can solve it, and we obtain at the end that a is actually this function, which looks like a generating function for the Porhammer Q Porhammer symbol. And so, now that we have an expression for p, just a times f, so this a times this f, uh, we can extract the coefficient and obtain directly this uh, the first expression I presented to you. Uh, that is useful for computer algebra manipulation. Uh, to prove the second expression, it takes uh, more work and we use uh, classic Q identities, uh, the following, uh, which link uh, the Pohammer symbols uh, with the infinite Pohammer symbols when you take uh, an infinite product uh, and the Q exponential. And finally, to obtain the Gaussian limit law, 
uh, we proved that Laplace transformed of the normalized random variable, so um, is uh, actually converges pointwise to the Gaussian uh, Laplace transform. Uh, so this is the classic way to prove uh, a continuous limit. Um, and to this Laplace transform is expressed using the probability generating function, uh, for which we have this nice expression here. And so to prove the convergence I mentioned, uh, we use the Laplace method uh, for sums to obtain the asymptotics of this sum for a fixed s when n goes to infinity. Uh, so here I plotted uh, in green uh, the true uh, Gaussian uh, probability density function and in blue the empir empirical one we obtain uh, blue, purple, red for uh, n equal to 100, 300, or 600. And we see that we are slowly converging to the green curve, uh, as expected. So, of course, those are the uh, normalized, uh, rescaled uh, plots. Okay, in conclusion, uh, an interesting open problem we have uh, on our hands is what is... Okay, w we understood that the best algorithms are the causal ones. But uh, what if we didn't know that? What if we only knew that it's silly to ask queries between two vertices that are uh, that belong to the same component of positive answers, or between two uh, components that have are already linked by a negative answer? So we avoid those silly queries, but we don't keep necessarily causality, and we choose uh, queries at random. Then what is the average complexity here? My intuition is that it's going to be the same uh, asymptotically as for color algorithms, but I would like to prove it. Um, there is another very natural uh, model for uh, random partitions, and that is fix the maximum number of blocks, k, and a distribution on 1, 2, 3, k. Um, and then each vertex uses independently this distribution to choose its block number. Uh, here we have a conjecture about the best algorithm, and we have analyzed its average complexity, as well as the average complexity of a random algorithm. Um, and here the, 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 the conjecture best algorithm is uh, better than the, the random one. Uh, we also have results about noisy queries. Uh, that's the case when the answer from the experts can contain mistake. So there are two different models that are interesting. One is to say, okay, there are going to be at most k errors in the answer, and I want to be able to detect them and then correct them uh, wherever they are. But that requires a lot of additional queries. So another uh, setting that is a bit uh, that we call it, that is less costly, is to say that each answer is going to be an error with a small probability p. And then we want to uh, minimize the probability that, to, to, that there is an undetected error after we have asked a queries and added some additional queries uh, to make results more robust. And, yeah. That's it. Have a good conference.